Welcome to Backstory and Beyond with your host, Ward Kampf, seeker, innovator, and president of Northwood Retail. As Ward travels the country, he'll share the industry insights he's gained over a three decades long retail career, introduce you to trailblazing business leaders and disruptive founders, and uncover the real deal about some of the greatest cities in the world. This week, Ward heads to Phoenix to chat with Lauren Bailey and Craig DeMarco, founders of Upward Projects, a restaurant group united around one simple mission, to make people feel good. They'll discuss how honest feedback can revolutionize a business and why unique is worth the extra effort. Plus, a surprise guest appearance from one of Ward's nearest and dearest. All that and more on this episode of Backstory and Beyond. I'm lucky to be in Phoenix, Arizona today. I have two special guests, Lauren Bailey and Craig DeMarco. They have a really interesting company called Upward Projects. And so I'd love to just get into your story. You know, Craig, you've been around this market. You were involved in LGO, Chelsea Kitchen. You know, you're, you guys are in a town of superstars. This is the Wall Street of restaurants. So let's just walk through the story. Craig, kind of tell me how you got involved. Lauren, from what I understand, you, you know, you were kind of serving in a restaurant and, you know, the rest was history. You guys decided to team up. So maybe just start from the beginning. How far back do you want to go? Like dishwashing at age 15 yeah. in, a, in a village <laughs> yeah. inn to save yeah, yeah. up to buy a Volkswagen? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that far back? However, wherever you want to start. You know, that's really where it started. My, my need for a, four wheels and a steering wheel. But tell uh, them why though. Yeah. There was a cute girl that I was <laughs> at a crush on and I wanted to take her out to see a band called Modern English. Remember that band? Kind of a one hit wonder. Ended up uh, washing dishes, saving up, buying a Volkswagen. But anyway, I went to ASU, which we both are alumni of ASU, and uh, so is my wife, and uh, waited tables and bartended on Mill Avenue at a total chug and puke place for almost all of my college career, and got out and bumped around in the restaurant business because I really enjoyed it. And then when we got engaged and uh, were aspiring to live in the Arcadia neighborhood, my wife and I got as close as we could, which was 36th Street in Campbell. We bought our first little home over there, and we do uh, boxer rescue through Boxer Love Rescue, and we were walking our our rescued boxers up and down Campbell Avenue and stumbled across 40th Street in Campbell, and that's where the the first Postino started, and that was April 4th of 2001, and then about a year later, we did La Grande Orange Grocery, June 3rd, 2002, with some partners, and then quickly, quickly after that, Lauren uh, was brought into our universe and we uh, connected and been partners ever since. So it's been pretty amazing. I think there was a story about Lauren maybe going and doing her thing. And it sounds like you guys got in a room and or something, had a conversation, maybe decided, Hey, it was better to partner up. And it obviously looks that way, you know, looking back on success, but Lauren, how did that story? I always want to say we had like this really amazing masterful business plan, but we never did. We didn't even have a PL until I think we had four or five restaurants, but, um, backing up a little bit, I, we had a really similar beginning. I think both of us put ourselves through school at ASU waiting tables and I made a fake resume to get a job at PF Chang's, which is interesting because Rick Federico now is still one of my best friends and mentors, but they ended up hiring me. I'd never worked in a restaurant and it was really busy. It was the second one ever. And I get to the end of the shift and the guy's like, you've never worked in a restaurant before, have you? And I was like, no, but I really need this job. And he's like, slams this big binder on the table. And he's like, you better learn everything in this by tomorrow or I'm going to tell everybody what you did. And that was my entrance to the to the biz and, um, you know, went through school doing that and never thought that I would end up in this business. I was really interested in art and design and um, was going to go to grad school in New York and randomly met this guy who made $30,000 working in a Nantucket in the summer. And I said to my friend, I'm like, let's break up with our boyfriends, sell all our stuff and let's go to wherever this Nantucket place is. She was down. And so that's what we did. And, you know, I remember the night that I was like shaking the martini, like looking around and being like, I love this business. It's everything I love. And the great thing for, I think, Craig and I both was that the Internet was not what it is today. And I tell the young ones this now. I'm like, you guys are kind of screwed because you can Google how hard things are. We couldn't do that. And so I'm sure if I would have Googled how hard is it to open a restaurant, I would have not probably gone that route. I probably would have gone to grad school anyway. So I made my thirty thousand dollars. In my mind at the time, I was like, I could probably open two restaurants with this. This is great. 
came back, was realizing that my $30,000 wasn't indeed going to go very far. I met Craig and started working at Postino, and he was selling the tables. And I said, hey, I want to buy those tables. And the thing you have to know about Craig is, like, he's really good at getting people to do stuff. Like, he can get anybody to do anything. And he was like, well, hang on, let's talk about this, you know. Let's hear what you're doing. And he had a lot of irons in the fire with Bob, his former partner. And, you know, it just kind of made sense. I think right away we knew we were pretty aligned on the way we wanted to do things you know, without having said business plan. And he's just such a generous human. I mean, right away, he was like, look, whatever money you can raise, you can buy in and have equity. And most people, I think, in his position would have been like, oh, I'll give you like 5%. Yeah. And I was 24 or 25 at the time. And I mean, I begged, borrowed, stole credit cards. We had $17 in our bank account when we opened Postino Central. And um, we were going to auctions, doing all the things. And I said to my husband at the time, I was like, look, worst case scenario, we're going to go bankrupt. We're going to have to sell our house because we took a second mortgage on our house. It was 2007. And um, we'll move in with your parents. That's going to suck. But we're still going to be us. I'll go back to bartending and we'll be fine. And away we went. And so we just worked all the time. Slept in our cars multiple times. We'd go out behind the dumpster, slam a beer, cry a little bit, slap each other on the back and be like, got to get back out there. That is <laughs> one of my best, my favorite stories. We opened up Postino and Gilbert. And it was busier than we anticipated. And Lauren and I and, and our spouses were on, I don't know how many days and hours in a row. And Lauren and I had a moment where we both broke down and cried behind the dumpster. And I think that was what brought us even <laughs> closer together. But I miss those times in the biggest of ways. You know, I saw James Cameron, he had an avatar coming out at Christmas. I mean, the guy had already made two of the biggest movies in the world, right? But he's like, it's about opening weekend. And, you know, he was nervous. And so do you guys, to this day, you know, in the early days, it was just, you didn't have a choice. But do you today even, like, when you open or do you kind of know what you have? You never know. I think it's like day by day. We wake up every day and hope people will show up. I mean, that's our business. And the thing that's different about now, even though it was like five, ten years ago, you can't have a crappy restaurant for very long because the way that, you know, before Yelp was around, it would take a while before people to figure out your restaurant sucked. Now it can take a matter of days. And I know I speak for both of us when I say that we're grateful every day people show up and you got to earn it. You can, you can screw up like once and if you have a dedicated guest, they'll come back, but you do it twice and it's you know, it's, it's a, it's a bad thing. And our team knows that they have to earn that every day. And I think for me, like, do we still wake up and like read Yelp reviews, only the negative ones every night before an opening? Yes. Right. <laughs> Technology's definitely changed yeah. you know, the business um, for sure. in a lot of different ways, you know, whether it's Yelp, you know, open table, whether it's even the technology in the restaurant, like a toast or whatever. So speak to that. How does that impacted your business for better, for worse? It's data. I think it's like fire. It can keep you warm at night, but it can also burn your house down. You know, I think it's really easy to get sucked into that world and lose track of what really matters, which is delivering really great moments to guests. And if it's outside of that, I think the data at times when it's taken to an extreme can lead you down a path that may not be in service of those intentions because it makes financial sense or because you think it's this and it's really not. Our business is so like art and science like yours. And right. when that balance gets out of whack, it can be catastrophic. And I think the data is helpful. It's great to know. We've always had a great relationship with guest feedback and really embrace that. We're really proud to have almost all of our restaurants, four and a half stars on Yelp and really high sentiment scores. Um, but to me, it's about aggregating it, simplifying it, having it be the right audience and not being overly influenced and just do the right thing. Like I don't even show Craig a lot of the data because he has such a good guttural instinct with real estate, with menu pricing, all that kind of stuff. Like we just used to get a menu and put like I'd hand him the menu and I'd be like, we need to do a price increase. And he'd get a big black marker and like right on there, like what feels right. And then, of course, we would run the numbers in the background, but I think that guttural sort of art thing deserves to be protected as much as the data part does. You know, I would, I would also say why people in the background in this town talk about you guys is you guys go in and take the tough road. Speak to that. I mean, not many people want to deal with redoing an old building, and I think that's what kind of separates you. And I think it also, it brings out, you know, one of your core values, I think, is authenticity. I think that's why so many people look at it because people are craving that right now. 
you know, so tell me about thoughts. It's so on, nice, especially from you, Ward, because you see everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you guys look at it that way, but if you step back, there are a lot of these brands that grow and, you know, there's, there's a formula, right? They want a box. It's X by X by X. There's a floor plan. It's very formula driven. It's data driven. And you guys are like, Hey, you trailblaze, but you also, you look at the real estate, you look at the building and say, it's almost like you're attracted to problems, right? We like pain. <laughs> <laughs> it, it finds us. I think those buildings are just really special. And we've sort of always through the years, I mean, Federal Pizza is a great example of that. They, the building sort of dictated what they wanted to be. It wasn't that we were like, oh, we want to open a pizzeria. Then where should we go find a building? And I remember standing in the like teller lane with Craig and we were like, dude, it would be so cool if you could pick up a growler, a beer and a really good wood fire pizza in a pickup lane and federal pizza is born. And, um, you know, that's an Al Beetle building and it's architecturally significant. And I think, you know, over the years, honestly, I don't know if we were smart enough to know that we were doing it the hard way, but it felt it always came out and felt right. Yeah. And I think, again, a lot of things that we connected us, one, you know, core values to uh, uh, really caring about design and architecture and historical relevance. And, and Chris, my wife and Lauren are, you know, both super creative people and, and your, your guys' relationship. And I, I miss that a lot too. When Chris and Lauren were really working together, designing these old buildings or looking at them from with the restrictions they had and making them into something really special for the neighborhood and giving them a second chance at life. Like Federal Pizza, like she said, it was first federal savings and loan. It was their branch on Central. And now it's got this teller window where you get this cool experience. So so there's something I, you know, that I have found with everybody that we have spoken with is the obsession with the front line. You know, that you're obsessed. What's going on in the restaurant? You have to be, right? You have to. I mean, we're going to open the Woodlands this weekend and then um, I'll drive around on Saturday and we're going to visit every restaurant in Houston and see the teams and check it out. And we ask all the people who've been there, you know, what's happening. And, and Craig had this favorite comment. Like we, if you ask, if I say, Ward, did you go to Postino? How was it? You'd be like, oh, it was great. But he'll ask you like, what could we have done better? And I think inviting and opening that feedback, like we have been sponges for feedback from our teams, from our customers, our vendors. I mean, those those that ecosystem is so important. And it's not just about like your employees, if they don't feel good, they can't make other people feel good. Right. And that's why our baseline intention is just to make people feel good. That's the business that we're in. And we found over the years, the bigger we got, we had to change kind of how we did a lot of that stuff. Like Craig and I would roll in there all the time, ask for feedback. We'd be like, hey, what do you think about this? What are people saying about that new dish? And it got harder because we're only one person. We can't be everywhere. So we came up with this email address, I think at upwardprojects.com. Feel free to send a message to say hi. Um, but they can send anything to that, anonymous or with their name. It can be a suggestion, a kudos for somebody, something they don't like. And what we found is like giving people this path to give feedback, both the people that are close to us, our teams, vendors. We ask vendors to rank us as a customer every year. And it's so interesting what we get back. And it just galvanizes these relationships with these stakeholders in a way that not only helps us improve the business, but just deepens that connection even more. Speak about Upward Projects. Why that name, your values, just speak to the whole thing, why you started. You know, call it that and what's kind of the genesis of upward projects we had this really lame name it was called soul circle and we were like we sound like a bunch of hippies sitting around smoking pot so that's a no and then it was weird because i was staying at the ace hotel and i was on the phone with craig and chris and i don't remember why we had to have this name for some reason like we'd we'd started the hospitality company and we knew we didn't want to make it about us and we've also always had what we call shiny object syndrome so we wanted it to be able to be like you never know what we'll do and um, like Craig always wanted to have a bar. You tried for that for a long time. You oh, brought yeah. it up in a while. For a dive bar. He wanted to own a dive bar. Anyway, so I was on the phone with them in New York at the Ace Hotel coming down the stairs and we're talking about this and how Soul Circle is lame. And I see this big painting that says, upward always. And I was like, God, we're always like talking about how do we move up? How do we grow? How do we bring people up? And it just, that word felt like so clear that that needed to be a part of it. And then, you know, we just wanted a name. I think you, I think Chris actually was like projects is like encompassing of the thing. And so. Yeah. We don't want any limited just to restaurants or hospitality, or like, but we didn't like just concepts because we felt like that was like not authentic. Right. Sure. And that these projects were like 
they were really big projects. And so it sort of fit. And I think it was indicative of our personalities. And we felt it was like, snap, that was that. Talk about, you know, I'm in the Windsor. I had never really looked at that cassette wall and the, the, just the things you do in your restaurant. I mean, you know, the cassettes on that wall are insane. You know, it's, did you see some of them were, were like mixtapes that people made in the eighties? Yeah, yeah. There's one called the panty dropper mixtape. Someone <laughs> donated. It wasn't, you know, yeah. it just showed up in the, in the donation pile. And, you know, we laid them all up there and the, the first four cassette tapes, the cornerstones that we put up as the, as the partners in the corner and then built it from there. But half the fun was the smashing party with all the ones that didn't make the cut. He was insistent that there would be no Celine Dion tapes there. Yeah. The funny thing about this was this idea came about because we had no money and we were like, this wall's huge and it's kind of this transition between Churn and Windsor. And so we, we came up with this idea and then we went to the Salvation Army and Goodwill and stuff and they were surprisingly still relatively expensive. So we were like, okay, if we put this out to our e-posse, our email club, and we say, bring us your tapes and we'll give you $5 gift cards. And we got so many of them and that also we kind like of six or seven thousand what yeah. a brilliant ideal too you know well, well, now they're they connected to, come, to it yeah they wanted to come back and see their tape and they still do what's depressing about it is like kids like they're like what are those my son was like mom what is that and i'm like oh burn but that really gave way to what ultimately ended up becoming these art walls that go in almost every location and there's never a second one that we ever do um, and they usually relate in some way to the buildings or telling the story. Because when we went to Lohi in Denver, our first out-of-market location, it was an old bookbinding building. So we got books donated from people, brought them up there, cut the spines, and like I tiled them. It took me three days to do it. And um, it's just been such a special thing that we think, you said, just makes it feel different. There's one other thing we did at Windsor that's part of our kind of our core values and of our company. If you're standing at the tape wall in the Windsor and you look down – in the concrete, it says, you should, in brass letters, you should. And if you walk around to the other side of the kitchen, it continues in the floor and says, question authority. It's like the rose line. And no one ever sees it together because there's a kitchen in between them. But if you know it and you read it, you should question authority. And that's always been one of our things that we've, again, we've bent some rules and maybe broken a couple. I don't incriminate ourselves, but <laughs> we, we always try to have some civil disobedience going on because it adds more soul to the project. I mean, you are, you're the insurgent. It doesn't sound like you have this corporate manual other than you do have five or six really good core values that you have. I think in every meeting room, that's how you hire and fire. But it does feel like, the insurgency part is, you, you know, you put it well, civil disobedience, kind of like it's not against the law. You're just going against the grain, right? You know, I mean, it's, it is, there's nobody that I've seen that's been able to pull this off. And it, it obviously comes from being authentic, genuine, and taking the hard road. But is there any, where do you guys get the inspiration? You know, I mean, is it architecture? Is it travel? We're soaking it all up. It's definitely that. I mean, we love to, Chris and I, like I said, are always sending photos of things back and forth right, that right. we see. Craig and Chris travel a ton. I mean, they just got back from this epic trip in Portugal. I mean, ate tons of food. Like they'll send photos. We work really closely with our chef team too. Even though the menu is is what would be perceived as simple, it's actually very challenging because it needs to be shareable. It's got to be able to be executed in our kitchens. And then it has to be great and consistent. It has to fit the brand. And then it needs to be within a certain price point. And so, you know, it makes it a little harder to R&D than it would be like a traditional environment. And I think as it relates to the food, it has a lot of boxes to check. So we're always kind of sending stuff. We eat out a ton. We're And there's just like a lot of where I'm a home cook. I cook a ton. Um, COVID was like, that was my therapy. Um, I was like jamming stuff, dropping off like bottles of pickles. I'm Southern too. So it's like part of my lifestyle, but, um, you know, we're just always soaking up everything we can. We love our other fellow restaurateurs. We have really good friendships within that community too. And, um, just love to see what people are doing. And like great restaurateurs as you travel, I'm sure you go around and get inspiration or you see ideas or maybe there's a little nugget you pick up, right? I think I have like 150,000 pictures on my phone yeah. and I'm like, I cannot delete one of these photos. Cause I will be like, Oh, this one time I saw this thing and I got to find it. And like right. that location finder of the photos is so choice because you know, you saw that thing in Chicago and you need to pull it up again. And, um, you know, back in the day we subscribed to all of the Bon Appetits, all the design magazines, right. and we would pull out like the f actual physical pictures and we would catalog them in binders of like food ideas design ideas and then we would build these sort of like boards of like the visions 
and we would come up with it. Well, now Pinterest is there, so you can do that on speed. Well, I think part of part of travel, you know, or seeing other things is just you draw inspiration. You, know, you see people doing great things. You're like, God, I never thought it could be done that way, right? Mm-hmm. You pick up ideas, and then you come back, and you say, we got to get better, right? Yeah. Always. Someone we really admire, Will Gadara, had a quote who started 11 Madison Park, and he said, service is the act of delivering something to someone, and hospitality is how you make them feel while doing it. And I think Craig and I for years just organically have really connected with that intention and just really, really wanted to make people feel good along the way. I mean, I remember this lady coming into Postino Arcadia and I was talking to her and she started telling me this story about Craig that when she first had her son, who was like eight or nine at the time, and she's like, you know, I had the worst postpartum depression and I would show up here every day and I, and Craig would come talk to me and it was the only way I got, I swear I would have killed myself if I hadn't have been come here every day for like six weeks and he made me feel better. And you know, you get those moments sometimes and she's telling me this, I mean, this is 10 years later and she's tears in her eyes. And it's like, in those moments you realize like what we do is so much more than, you know, we're here to make money. It's like, we, we're just two degenerate bartenders, you know, really. And to be able to create these moments for people in these spaces is just like the best thing ever. You know, we always strive to be better. You think about it. Do you guys ever just step back and say, man, wow, we created something really special? It's hard to, right? You're in the middle of it. You got kids, you got life, you've got employees you care about, but do you ever just smile and enjoy it? Is that something you guys do? Because you, you have created something really unique. You know, I'm fortunate that my wife, Chris, reminds me all the time because I'm really insecure most of the time about it about it might go away or it's not good enough and we have to strive even harder and just, but she, she does remind me and there's moments, but I don't, I don't spend much time in that space. I think I have a a big healthy dose of insecurity. (laughs) So, and maybe that, that's, I think that's kind of drives all of us. It all drives all of us, but there are moments and like, we'll go over to Arcadia after this and I'll go by there sometimes and think, wow, yeah, 23 years of all the things that have happened in this building with our team members, our vendors, obviously the guests, it is it is pretty special. My mom always told me that, Lauren, you better stop looking at the trophy case, next play. And she shortens it at times just to be next play if you get too much talking about yourself or your accomplishments. And that's sort of just been ingrained in me forever. I think that where I do land a lot of times is realizing how special it is, like what we've gotten to experience and then my relationship with Craig and Chris and like, you know, we've worked together for 20 years, which is, I mean, in the amount of time, as you know, that you spend with your work counterparts is massive. Right. And we've gone through some really hard things like personally the business. And I think the thing about Craig and I is like, no matter what happened, there was like always this belief system that you're always coming back to the table, no Mm -hmm. matter what. And, and I think that to me is such a blessing outside of like, it's been awesome to build this business and we're super proud of it. But the people that we've been able to meet and change their lives, those are the things that you're just like, oh, we're so lucky to be able to do that. Right. And now it's time to move on to the real deal. I want to welcome a special guest, somebody that's real near and dear to my heart. You know, it's like a sister to me and also, you know, you're Craig's work wife. And I feel Jacqueline Fitch is the same to me. And, you know, not only are we friends, we do a lot of business. We have a lot of fun. So Jacqueline, welcome. We're in your hometown. That's so sweet of you. I truly feel the same way. I'm so grateful to have you in my life. And, you know, when I got married last year, my husband called Ward and asked him for my hand in marriage because he's been the most longstanding, other than parents, uh, longstanding male and role model in my life. And so that means a lot. She does tell us how much she loves you when you're not in the room, too. So I just want to throw that out there. We can't always tell him those things. (laughs) But my other two favorite people in the room, Lauren and Craig, who have been really instrumental in shaping my career, too. So love having you guys here. Thanks for having me. So let's get into it. Um, We're here to talk about the hidden gems of Phoenix. Phoenix has changed a lot, you know. 2008 and nine were pretty brutal around Phoenix. I mean, you know, here, Florida, Vegas were just, you know, crazy. But the last 10 years, Phoenix has just ascended. It's now one of the biggest metro areas in the country. So talk about the 
you know, what are some of your favorite places to go? Walk me through how you've seen the city change. What are your favorite restaurants? Yeah. What's the hidden gem? I'd love to get all your opinion on what the hidden gem of Phoenix is. And what's the one thing when people come to Phoenix or to Arizona that they absolutely should see? Top of Camelback Mountain. Stunning. Number one thing. He hikes it every day, every morning. He's hardcore. Oh, my I do, God. I do, you I do climb, hike it a lot. You but climb it, that it, mountain every day? I've done it for a very long time. But when you stand on the top of Camelback, you get a full 360-degree view of the valley all the way out to the southeast. I mean, I and might have to have see Lauren's, everything. And it's Lauren's smack- boyfriend take me I down I was going to say, like, for those of you <laughs> listening that want to attempt the hike, it is yeah. not for the faint of heart. Bring water, wear the right shoes, or yes, my boyfriend and bring will Lauren's have to rescue boyfriend. you off the but, mountain. But if you think about kind of, you know, 44th and Camelback, or at least 24th and Camelback, the Scottsdale and Camelback is the, the center of the valley. Camelback Mountain sits right in the middle. So to get to the top of that and to look around, it's a really special experience. I looked at it from my hotel this morning is you know right there and look back up at it and i do agree it's special it's very very unique i would have to say i think the taliesin west is a good spot this is a huge frank lloyd wright city i'm a total architecture nerd um and we have some amazing mid-century architecture and there's a bunch of his stuff um actually one really cool the david and gladys wright house over by craig's house too i think is taking visitors now but the architectural stuff you can see is absolutely worth doing and, you know, look, like Craig's been here. I mean, what, how old were you moved here? Like six? Uh, 10. Okay. 19, 1981. He knows everyone in Long town. Time, yeah. Every time we go meet somebody, he's usually made out with their sister in high school, college, <laughs> whatever. It was ASU. It was all kind you of know, a blur. What, what's the deal with that? Being the work wives, like this one too. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, I dated her. I knew her, her sister. OKC, I mean, Dallas. I, they can't help it if they're they just that themselves. desirable. I mean, yeah. We got lucky. Fail? Yeah, so um, we both went to ASU, and I think that has been really neat to watch Tempe transform. Well, the three of you went to ASU. Yeah, I went to ASU, too. And and my wife, yeah. Work them. It's been really cool to watch Tempe transition from, like, when we were there to really just this really cool area of Phoenix, and it's a place you'd want to live, and a lot of restaurants. And to your point earlier, I mean, we've seen a ton of people come to this market because it's so business friendly that, you know, a lot of California chefs or other people come from other places to do business here and transact because the real estate's more approachable. It's a really business friendly city. And I think that the food, how do I say this? Like the desire for a higher level of food is increasing all the time because there are just so many people moving here. And obviously Sam Fox has been a huge staple and a big impact to this city and really laid the groundwork, I think, for a lot of folks to come. But, you know, we're just starting to see you know, the kavas of the world come to our market. And I think a lot of people bypass us because they think, oh, there's no one here in the summer. And so it's been neat to get some of the the big people that we've been waiting for, both in retail and restaurant. I agree. I think mine is probably Royal Palms, Mm. just the history of that building. We go there, we have drinks, we sit on the patio. My bridal shower was there, but there's so much history to that building, even though it is a resort and hotel now, the the historic value of it really has like a sense of place and like a heartbeat for me. Yeah. We got married there. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Special. Really special. Yeah. So when you go out food wise, you know, you guys are obviously in the business, so it's going to be pretty tough. We're big Hillstone fans. (laughs) They know you by name there. (laughs) They know you by name. We just, we, Lauren and I just had dinner there the other night and I, I got home and I said, anytime I need to go to Hellstone, I have to go with LB. Like, it's a good spot. It's, only it's a good place, spot. only time I can get in. They have had the same bartenders there for 30 years. One of them retired yeah, finally. Tom but retired. Tom retired. But we're big fans of that. Um, I love also the Henry, I think, is really great. We go there quite a bit. There's been some really cool stuff that's open downtown. Like Bacanora has gotten some really good national press, which is awesome. And I love the Valentine. Have you been there yet? It's so good. It's so good. It's um, a really great chef there, and he's one of the most humble people. He's just a spectacular human, and his food is amazing. And it's in front of a mid-century furniture store, so I'm kind of getting all my best of both worlds. And then they have a really great cocktail bar in the back um, that was some um, mixologists that came out of Chris Bianco's system, and uh, they do a lot with like preserved stuff and just really, really beautiful cocktail program, and it's in an old fur coat locker, and it's a cool space too, so I dig that a lot. I'm a Durant girl. Yes. I love Durant. OG. Red Boost. A lot of, lot of history at Durant. For sure, Postino. I grew up in wine country, and I always tell this 
to anybody who calls that's in our industry and asks about, you know, what what wine bars do you really like? And so for me, saying Postino it means a lot because I grew up, you know, running around the vineyards and, and growing Zin. My family grows in. And so you guys have created something so special that reminds me a lot of home. Thanks, Jack. Craig, anywhere. Chris and I love going and finding the new spots, but we have our little bubble in our places we frequent, the Hillstones, the Buck and Riders. We do a lot of flower child takeout for the kids, you know, four or five, six nights a week sometimes. The new Buck and Rider. Steak 44, I think, is. Oh, staple. So good. Yeah. Staple. Like the bar. You know what's funny about that building? I think it's their best one because they it was a cork and cleaver and the volume of it and the space is so nice and how it's like, I know that wasn't probably what they would choose to design because you see Dominic's and it's big, but I love the intimacy and like the scale of that and like I live right by there. So popping in and sitting at that bar and the food is just, I mean, they took, Mastro's guys and level it up another notch. I send everyone to Steak 44. It's like, so good. Or the OG Mastro's up north where Mike lives. Yeah. I feel like they, they check the female friendly box too where like a lot of steakhouses 100%. don't with the portions and like the way that we all want to go there and The eat. vibe of the bar. Totally. Yeah. And then where do we find you guys? You know, handle, social, IG, address. Lauren yeah. Bailey LB, Upward Projects, Pusino Wine Cafe. Yeah, and if Anyone needs to get a hold of me, Lauren will tell. Lauren will forward me something. She'll forward me an email. Back the truck up. Back the truck up. Craig's Insta is Craig's Insta is Trey L Mix. Ooh. Yeah, spell it though, because no one's ever going to get that. T R E Y. I thought L M I C K S. C K S. Trey L Mix. That's his secret name in case you ever want to try to get a hold of him. I used to check into hotels under the radar. I'd use Trey L Mix. Yeah. What were you doing when you were doing that? I don't know. I don't know. So just in wrapping up, I want to thank A. Jacqueline for being our special guest today in Phoenix and Lauren and Craig. I know you guys are busy and I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. So fun. This has been Backstory and Beyond, hosted by Ward Camp. To learn more about Northwood Retail or the destinations from today's episode, visit BackstoryBeyond.com. 